All right. Today we have a very special guest, um, Indigo Angel. Welcome to our uh, our little private <laughs> club here, <laughs> the Interview with Ed uh, membership portal. Um, you have been on my radar for about about six months. I've been watching your material. Um, I, I'm not sure how I discovered it. I think it just showed up on a YouTube or something. Mm-hmm. And um, and then in Quinn's, we started talking, and coincidentally, you um, you had just come out with the uh, 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 event with Z. And, and you guys knew each other, so that was kind of a nice coincidence. Um, so welcome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to come and chat with you and talk with everybody. And um, that's so awesome that we were kind of crossing paths before we even realized we had that connection with Z. So um, that's just so synchronistic and I love that. It seems like all of the dominoes are kind of falling into place and, um, yeah, it was a great experience with Z. We came together and did the womb healing container coursework. Um, I have brought forth an extensive implant and, um, tag removal system for the divine feminine. So each one of us that participated in that container kind of brought forth our own expertise and just made this overall umbrella of healing that we were able to offer to about 400 plus women. So it was, it was really successful and it was amazing. And I was really excited to share it with everybody. And nice. so, yeah. <laughs> well, we definitely want to get into that and uh, sort of get to know you because traditionally, not traditionally, I guess we're, this whole portal thing is still kind of new. But um, I've sort of been going more into uh, re-interviewing old guests. So most of uh, our audience here have already been through sort of the, the, the introduction phases and got to know some of the channeling. So there's many, many channelers who, who come on the show, uh, many experiencers and, and many people like yourself and Z, who we had on uh, recently, who are just have this connection and are able to... Um, yeah tune in so to say so uh so a little bit different is because we don't really know much about you my audience doesn't i've been following your stuff uh, of, of recent but i i kind of wanted to spend the first hour just sort of to uh get to know your work and get to know who you are how um how you got into this type of work and then uh and then we can open it up to to our audience so it's it's a it's we're, we're in uncharted territory uh, this week with with our uh with our weekly calls, which is uh, fun because this is how I wanted to do it. I wanted to mix things up and and we'll have other guests, new guests and things here. And this is a great uh, platform to do it. So uh, first question is, um, how did this start for you? How did you start tuning in? Um, I, I know you're more of a sort of a conscious ch- uh, channel or, or you don't go into a deep trance or anything. Um, but this 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 world of of understanding and feeling the ley lines, talking to other beings, uh, connecting into this extra dimensional reality. Can you give us a little background on, on how it started for you? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, it all really feels like it was something or a deeper knowing from childhood. Most definitely, I think I was a very mm, just. I was very aware as a child um, of things that I felt like the adults weren't aware of. And I was also very sensitive um, as a child as well. So, um, you know, fast forward around 2013, I did go through a pretty intense spiritual awakening. Um, Mine was really through um, a near death experience and also um, for my immune system crashing. I had a lot of immune system breakdown at that time for about three years. That was really intense, which really broke down my spiritual shields. Um, Later, I come to know to find out that it really broke down my carbon based structures and was allowing me energetically and spiritually to um, become more holographic and become more crystallized Mm -hmm. in my DNA and my structures. And so I was accessing spirit at a whole different level from that point forward. Um, I remember holding crystals and 
just the spiritual experiences would be so profound. Sometimes I would be just, you know, a couple hours in this meditative state where I felt very outside of my body, where I was just continuously downloading um, higher dimensional information, knowledge, understanding, clarity, wisdom, just a constant stream of it. Um, I would have spiritual embodiment phases where I would feel spirits actually walk into me like Archangel Mother Mary. And I think that was all divine and a part of my healing, but um, I kind of learned how to attune to energies and um, activate to them um, invoke yeah. them yeah so so for example when when mary came in how did you recognize that it was her energy what was the if, if especially in the early phases if this was sort of new and and you have different yeah. energies coming in do, do they declare themselves this when they come through or how do you how do you recognize that definitely yeah um because i prior to that you know, I wasn't really aware of Mother Mary at that time, you know, mm -hmm. um, it was through my emotional body and very clairsentious and how I developed that into clear cognition. Um, but essentially, yeah, it was kind of like I'm Mother Mary and I am now inside of you. I'm inside of your body and you are now her and I'm going to, um, basically energetically upgrade me I walked around as mother Mary for about two weeks I believed that I was her and um, wow. I felt like everything that I was speaking everything that I was saying that it was her words her energy her strength and um so yeah it it, it I just knew I knew right away mother Mary was inside me so it's um and, and it's that kind like, of yeah <clears throat> and that, that happened with, with other beings as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I've kind of learned over the years of how to attune to those energies. Now call upon those energies, invoke those energies, work with those energies. If I so um, sometimes even desire to work with a spirit or, um, or an ascended master or an ultra terrestrial or an extraterrestrial, you know, you know, whatever it may ultimately be. Typically, if it comes into my field, it's because I am meant to work with that energy. Right. Um, there's something in my mission or information that I need, or there's something that is um, vital in terms of my own personal evolution and sometimes collective messages that I need to share. So they will come and guide me to certain things, activate me to certain things, tell me to go to certain places. Some of them tell me to go to Egypt, you know, um, and, you know, do certain things there. So, I mean, it just depends. Yeah. Um, do, do you have, do you have a, like a, many of the channelers who've been on the show before kind of have their go-to being, which is the, 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 what they're used to and, and to initially get into the channeling state, they, they, uh, they connect with that being first. And then from there, uh, the door opens and they can sort of meet these others. Do you have, is that work for you that way? Or do you just go directly to whoever? I'm kind of at a level now that I think a lot of my information is just direct electromagnetic imprint and stream from omnipotent source. Like I'm just connected right into source energy. So I don't typically go through um, other beings to bring forth information. Um but I do have, I guess, a spiritual um, group of, of, of supporters that I, I work with energetically or feel that they are guides to the things that I do. Um, and also that um, I honor and also sometimes even put offerings out to and things like this to, to work with their energy. But yeah, yeah. Um, I've kind of gone more um, grid worker in the things that I right. do in channel. Um, I think my evolution of my spirituality has gone from wanting to work, you know, with others and channel information for others and have this more of this human interaction. But I felt like once my consciousness went more galactic um, and became more quantum cognition, um, I started to embody higher levels of consciousness, what I call avatar consciousness or planetary logos consciousness, which allowed me to see deeper into planetary holographic architecture. 
Um, and so now I'm channeling more of the matrices that are inside of the earth's body and right. um, defining more of what it is to be a grid reader, a grid worker, a grid keeper, a gatekeeper, all of these things, right? They're all kind of mean similarly the same thing. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's go. I was, let's go in that direction because um, it seems to be a theme of late. Uh, with with uh, obviously with your work, you you're sort of really going deeper than I think anybody else has uh, with the with the, your vocabulary and your understanding of of these grid lines. But many people of late, in fact, I'm doing a full you know TV show uh, documentary series on. Um, uh, the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, and we're going around taking the skull to the different spots and activating spots. So it's it seems uh, of of late many uh, light workers are, are getting the call to uh, Z mentioned as well in her interview to to uh, to go to these spots and uh, and activate that. Can you go into that work a little bit more for our audience? I know if you're if any, whoever's following you knows uh, what you're doing of late, but just many people, uh, this is the first time to your work, so. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's de many different missions that grid workers hold. Um, I think it's really helpful if you kind of know your indigo type. So if you consider yourself to be a star seed or you consider yourself to be an empath or a crystal child or, you know, they're all kind of under the same umbrella, so to speak. I like to define them by indigo type. Um, and so um, it helps to know your indigo type because it kind of tells you what kind of a light worker you are, where are you working in your ascension capacities. Um, indigo type ones have typically been known to um, be the grid keeper, the gatekeeper, the, the ones that are working um, within the earth's architecture. And it's because what happens is through their ascension, as you become an indigo type one, you attune to higher levels of your DNA strands. So you're going from a 12 strand carbon-based structure to a 48. So within that, you're refining the diamond structures within your body, which allows you to embody more of the earth's holographic templating. Um, therefore to read it kind of like an internal mapping system um, that becomes more defined. And that's kind of how I realized all of this within my own work mm -hmm. was that I started to channel and create diagrams of internal stargate systems, internal mapping systems, internal structures inside the earth, how they're all interconnected, how we can use these as portal structures and gate systems and actually navigate through our own interdimensionality. But this is kind of what indigo type ones eventually evolve into and they're highest state of their evolution of their indigo type. Um, I think most people probably wake up around an indigo type two templating or an indigo type three templating. Indigo type twos are our spiritual healers. They are our shamans, our medicine people. Um, they're the ones that are here to really evolve the first through the 12th strand of the DNA and actually regenerate or restore or rehabilitate the bioenergetic field of the light body within the human spiritual original organic templating um and then and, and that, the and that original organic temp templing is that that goes back to you you talk about lemuria and mu that era or even further back <clears throat> well yeah definitely it could go further back um mm -hmm. in terms of defining that history like the hyperborean root races and the polarian root races most definitely i think this is when we had the first development of the earth's spiritual identity body i don't think there was maybe much human form here but there was definitely an evolution of what would be earth-based star seed consciousness like the phase the elementals the dragons the naga serpent primordial lace races and lineages these were you know the first chromosome types here that came in during those time frames um but then i think that the original human organic templating seeded um in the timeline of mu mm -hmm. and this was through um particular so this is if you go according to starseed consciousness, starseed belief, and starseed consciousness will activate grid worker consciousness. Um, but starseed consciousness is 
the belief or the understanding that, you know, extraterrestrial races, ultra terrestrial races, stargate systems, the intelligence field from these star systems were the basis for the development of human evolution and civilizational um, seedings that came here um, into the earth. And so my understanding is around the time of Mu that the Pleiadians and even the Arcturians and the Lyran systems, which are the ones coalitioned as guardians, mm -hmm. came here and seeded this consciousness into those dragon and serpent lineages and upgrading the chromosomes to a higher level of consciousness. I see. So yeah, I was going to mention Lyra because um, I've heard many times through um, through my other working channelings that they're sort of one of the root races for humanity. Uh, obviously, Octarians and Palladians as well, but like going way back, like Ly it, it seems like Lyra was the the originators of, of human consciousness. Well, is, is that, that, that yeah, resonate definitely, or? definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're they're one of many for sure. One of many. Um, yeah. I think there's definitely um quite a few um more are well known and there's a lot of less known systems i call them the occult systems um that play a huge role in the seeding of humanity as well they're just not as well known of definitely the draco system oh, um i do feel was one of the first primordial seeders here on this earth going back 500,000 plus years on this earth um so yeah lyrans as well i mean there was a huge lyran war in galactic history right. um yeah. where there was an invasion of the draco system into the lyran system and then many of the lyrans were displaced um and became refugee races also um became um uh new inhabitants in the orion system um which is then where most of the galactic warfare has played out and is still playing out to this day um oh still to uh -huh. say wow well i there's so many different uh uh you know I'm, i keep pull, I'm, I'm sorry to pull you away from your your stream we were let's go back to the uh um uh the indigo types and um you you, you got into type two and i'll try not to pull you away but that there's so, you, you drop so many nuggets during your whenever you speak <laughs> that it i'm like oh i want to go there i want to go there so uh i'll try not to, i'll try to stay focused on on the one subject but um I'm going to interject and and uh, go down some of these streams. Uh, when, yeah, when that's I can. okay. It's fun to go down the streams. It is fun. <clears throat> yeah. I get lost in them too. Sure. Sure, <laughs> I'm like, sure. where are we going? We can go. We're multidimensional. That's the fun thing about it. Is right, sometimes right. some things don't even have to connect. We just hop to the next thing. We're in another timeline. Well, um, you do a great job of connecting so many things. So that's that's why I, I uh, I'm sort of like I have this opportunity. I'm like, oh, let's connect that. Let's see if that works. So that, you know, so. And your work is vast and you cover, you know, what, what, just the short amount of time we spent here, 20 minutes, we've covered like enough to unpack probably for, for a long <laughs> while. But let's keep going. Let's keep going. And uh, let's go back to our indigo types. You said type two is the shamans. And uh, mm -hmm. is there a type three? Yes, there is a okay. type three. Um, these are the ones that kind of act as a bridge between light and dark realms. They, you know, transmute a lot of polarity and duality laws for themselves and also for the collectives. They're more of spiritual warriors and justice fighters. They work in high levels of alchemy. Um, and their job is to really restore and rehabilitate more of the degraded genetics and soul lines, such as like the Nephilim the reptilian lines, the Anunnaki lines, um, you know, may even go into like the Zetas and, and Greys. I heard from the Galactic Federation that they were trying to rehabilitate Greys now. So I'm like, oh, great, new news to me. Um, but yeah, so it's really, a, they're here to reverse the anti-life architecture. They're here to reverse the reversal codes that run in people's bodies and the worship of death culturalism here on the earth. And so they have one of the strongest and most difficult missions. They're often usually under high levels of spiritual attack mm -hmm. and infiltration. And um, a lot of indigo threes ultimately evolve into an indigo type one. Indigo type twos typically stay sometimes within that framework of their consciousness and what they're meant here to do in terms of their mission. But threes mm -hmm. will often be propelled into a one mission and it is because they hold 
rescue missions here. Um, they're the ones that are able to go into more maybe degraded gate sites in the earth, navigate artificial and man-made stargates and reverse that for the, the planetary body. So they can work on the behalf of the planet's spiritual body. And um, so yeah, indigo type threes, they are our toughest cookies yeah um, i was gonna say it sounds like they're the the the, the <laughs> on the ground foot soldiers of of yeah. the of this whole thing um is this more of a uh per incarnation or is this like a, a, a like that a soul group or a soul uh mission that continues over many lifetimes or is this kind of what one lifetime at a time kind of thing for these indigo types in terms of multiple lifetimes of grid work, I'm not too sure. Um, it's the technology, honestly, that I've only come into my awareness over the last four years. Um, so my studies of, was I doing grid work in past lives? Um, potentially in maybe. Um, I'm starting to kind of see that there is a new indigo type that's coming online. I call it an indigo type four. Um, mm -hmm. And it's where they have the ability to um, basically, um, bring forth a lot of future prophecy. They have the ability to really anchor galactic realms here into the planetary body. And because of that reason, it may be something that may be, um, something that is learned over lifetimes and is just inherited as a consciousness that you reawaken to again. Um, I think that some people are conscious of those indigo type templatings as they're growing up, um, unconsciously manifesting life paths that will prepare help them and already kind of doing it right um such as like an indigo type one they might have been you know traveling all their lives or taking career choices that allow them to travel or you know incarnating into a family line that their family is in the military so they're constantly moving all the time just certain things can come up that would um give them some sort of um clarification that they were an indigo type one all along um, but then for some people, I think it's about waking up to that and it's a new activation and it's new in their awareness and their consciousness, and then they're activated by it and they're propelled into mission and they just start, you know, taking it on and, and walk in those guardian codes, which is actually about taking on a parental role on this earth. Um, all indigo types are technically born with their sixth strand of DNA activated. It might be dormant in their level of consciousness that they're able to perceive that that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like me as a child, I was just like, I was just a very sensitive child. I felt everybody's emotions. And I, you know, I was, um, always felt people's pains and ailments. I always wondered like, why can I see why that person has back issues and they're hurting here? And, you know, it's like, you really can see what somebody's ailments are, you know, that's wow. me being, having my sixth gen activated and just not being aware of that. Well, what, what type were, are you? I was going to ask, do you know? Um, I consider myself an indigo type one. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you think most people who are sort of aware of, well, I guess it's, you just mentioned there's this different, different types. I wonder, <clears throat> I, I wonder, I'm curious to our audience uh, here. Well, maybe we can get into that when we open it up. Uh, yeah. What, what, what indigo types are you able to see the types of uh do they like auras and things do they do they exhibit a certain color or uh, um energy signature um they can definitely yeah the auras um would be um definitely different i think if you're an indigo type one you're probably going to be more working with then different creational rays and different creational spectrums. So different chakra systems will be activated according to that and probably expand more within the auric field to be most identified. Mm -hmm. um, indigo type ones I'd say are really within the purity rays. So they're probably gonna be more white ray based. Um, indigo type twos, these are good questions too. It's just making me think. Um, yeah. Indigo type twos would be, um, more green right because they're more healing um they're going to be also mm. probably more violet because there's a lot of transmutation um indigo type threes will probably be with working within the blue ray spectrum and um because that's kind of the 
I want to say it's like the protective energies, the protected fields of the astral levels and layers and the auric fields. So they would be uh, probably more within those currents and streams of intelligence, according to primal light color spectrum and how the universe connects sure, sure. through that. Well, let's go back to the to the grid work and the <clears throat> ley line stuff, um, since that's sort of the more recent um, sure. uh, aspect of your work. Um Recently, you, you you did a great uh, sort of explanation of like the Georgia Guidestones and, uh, and and all of the funniness that 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 goes on there. Now, is that like an artificial uh, uh, grid line or is that some a grid line that's been hijacked? How do how do because we have in our history, uh, even, you know, when the Spain Spaniards uh, went into Central and South America and destroyed the uh, indigenous um uh, villages and stuff they would you know rape and pillage and then um build their churches on top of the sacred sites intentionally to to capture some of that energy um is, is it uh is the georgia guidestones in that type of thing or how to uh, what's your um interpretation of, of that yeah um the georgia guidestones i did a couple deep dives on that did a remote view also went out to the site to kind of just feel the energy and right. pick up on the land i also want to go back to it because i'm almost thinking that there's an open wormhole there now that they impacted it um that they might have been imploding into the nuclear energy because i was seeing that there was like wells of uh nuclear pockets of radiation that was up underneath the shaft of it because there's a shaft like a lunar shaft that goes all the way down from the stones wow um, but I think it is a man-made and artificial gate site that is was running reversal codes, 5D reversal codes, um, propagating and upholding collective fields of consciousness that would be connected to, you know, depopulation and um, transhuman agendas. Um, all of these things. And so, yeah, I think that there was a technology that was utilized by those that were holding the nefarious agendas, negative agendas. Um, and that was to place them interdirectionally um, to function, operate off of particular energy goods or current systems that are flowing from, I think it was the trajectory was like the North um to the west corner or something like that i was i had it all laid out in my update that i did but um yeah tapping into the currents in the fields of the universal grids that are already running to pull in energy um and then i also think that there was a huge you know energetic control overlay that was connected to that site that was connected to all of the military bases mm. um the nuclear submarine radiation stations down in the lower parts of georgia um, yeah, and you then mentioned i also that, and you mentioned that too i've been down to um uh cumberland island i don't know if you've been there or visited that place and um i used to go there uh, i was working on a star trek tv show and uh Every time it was the st stage was located there. So I would go there and do ceremony and the energy there was just super intense. So it's it was a nice synchronicity when you mentioned the base because the base is just right off the coast there. And it just made sense, uh, the energy that I felt on that island. Um, and it was just like connecting all these dots for me. So thank you for <laughs> for helping with that. Yeah, of course. I, I it. It blew my mind too, to be honest with you, once I really kind of dived into it. This is one of the hats I wear. I like to be kind of like an investigator, spiritual right. detective, I call myself, um, and kind of map out, you know, what are all the energy systems that are running here? What's the encryption of everything? And how is it all interconnected? I think one of the big things that I noticed with that and why I tied it into nuclear radiation so much mm -hmm. was I think that there was open portals or wormholes that were connected to other degraded nuclear waste sites on the earth, such as um, Fukushima right. and um, Chernobyl. Right. Um, because if you even look at the area of Georgia, you know, they have one of the largest nuclear radiation plants that is right next to the Georgia Guidestones, not very far. Mm. Um, and then again, the connection to the nuclear submarine. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the time, just the planetary activations that were happening, I was really tying in all of that uh, nuclear energy. Um, 
into souls and spirits that were kind of getting trapped in the space time continuum. Mm -hmm. And so that they were coming in fragmented um, through those nuclear portals. And then this is just one of the ways that warfare overall collectively is generated. I mean, if you look at what was going on with Russia at the time, um, I believe they were, you know, trying to take over some of the nuclear sites for some of their warfare zones and things like this. So it's really interesting how you just start making all of those connection pieces. Um, well, it, um, I mean, definitely in the, in ufology and in, in that's sort of my start was in the, in that, from that crowd and moved into where we are now, but um, it's sort of unanimously uh, believed that with the launch of the Trinity bomb in you know 1945 that that opened up the portals and uh at least set you know set off the yeah. the warning signs and and we had many ets and you know craft uh, obviously we're here prior but they really started to show up around then and, and i actually go into this in in my show uh the the skull show we uh the trinity um case which happened one month after it's a crash that happened one month after the um the, the Trinity bomb was was detonated. Um, and there's still a, a witness alive today that um, came upon a, a crashed UFO. So, you know, we're doing some repair work there with the skull and we're kind of, that's a big focus of, of the, um, of the skull project is taking it around to these, to these um, damaged sites, indigenous sites that have, uh, you know, sacred ceremonial grounds that have, um, congested energy or or distorted energy mm -hmm. from the massacres and the different things that are that have gone on there so um so it's all it's all connected for sure the, the, yeah it sounds like you're a grid worker <clears throat> it sounds like you're doing grid work yeah I, i'm following the people who are doing the grid work uh, and i think that that's why z reached out to me for your guys's project um and perhaps, uh, you know, we, you know, not to put any spoilers out there, but uh, uh, we might be working in the future on doing some grid work type. Uh, it, they make for great shows, you know, for like travel shows. This, the new travel shows of the future are, you know, not which uh, which restaurant has the the best food, but you know, which which uh, energy spot has the you know the most intense um, energy and and then uh, and then maybe we build a restaurant next to it you know and, and go try, try out what, what cuisine is related to that power I, spot <laughs> I think that's such an amazing idea and I think I think it's the new um, the new wave of, of the higher consciousness community of what's really um, important and what's most activated in people right now. Um, I can tell you that if you could capture that on video, just the power of these Stargate systems, I went down to Machu Picchu recently. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, I was so, um, cause I love to go and study Stargate mechanics. I think that's probably at the root of my passion is what do these Stargates look like? Can I mm -hmm. interdimensionally tune into them? Can I see them? And I started to realize that each Stargate on the earth is completely different, different architecture, different geometry, different ways in which it's held and sacredness in the land and um, the alchemical and, and biospiritual exchange that's happening is so unique and diverse. So you're going to get a different experience at every Stargate you go to. Um, and I think as you're a grid worker and Indigo type one, you know, you go to that Stargate, you get and gather all of that evolutionary information and you might not even understand what all of it means you just know you're being upgraded your light body fields being upgraded you're being activated and then you take that information and then you're a conduit you're a transmitter so then you take yeah. that to another system or another gate site or um to someone who needs the information and then that's how we work as a spiritual network of a collective that is just intuitively healing the earth and healing humanity and it's really an incredible thing that we're able to actualize this and speak about it now i right, mean right. It, well speaking of sort of the reason i had to push the call to today instead of yesterday so yesterday I went out to the integratron are you familiar with that uh device in that area in in uh near joshua tree california uh it's a <clears throat> it's a very um it's a very intense uh, uh, ley line spot that uh, became famous in the 1950s because of a uh, visitation 
from um, several visitations, but one more famous from uh, a craft that had landed on the, on an airstrip. Actually, it was a, 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 a sort of a not an official airstrip, but this guy named uh, George Van Tassel used he worked with Howard Hughes and he. Uh, went and created his own airstrip out in the middle of um, the the California desert, and um, it's a very powerful. The giant rock is is this big rock that uh, indigenous did ceremony with, and um, a lot of prophecy around it. But he actually lived underneath the rock and uh, was awoken one night when he had a um, a visitation. So we went there, and then the you know his story is, is amazing because the guy. Uh, he, he there's he said it was they were from venus but we know venus is a portal for other beings to come through um and he uh had a triangular uh, amulet that then pointed to this crystal mountain which you, it's just right a, a, a few a, a stone throw away from from giant rock and uh it, it started glowing and beaming and all this information i guess was being downloaded into the uh the et's amulet um, but anyways, that spot, you can go there and he built this, he got downloaded, uh, or, or uh, told to, about this device to, to build, uh, and Van Tassel built it. He built the Integratron and over the years, it's been, um, sort of deactivated in the, he was, he was trying to do some Tesla type technologies and, um, mm -hmm. it's sort of been shut down. So it was this rotating, uh, uh floating, rotating disc around a counter, uh, uh rotating magnetic fields anyways the, the but the device itself uh the energy is still there and can be activated and we were doing some of that work yesterday um so i just wow. didn't know if you you had that if you knew about the integratron and then that leads uh, uh me into the question of uh you had talked about the trons and mm -hmm. um metatron Integratron, um, and I found out yesterday the Integratron name was given to it afterwards. So I don't think Van Tassel had given the name the Integratron, um, and that could have been uh, some other energies coming in to again to take over or try to hijack that spot. But even if it was hijacked, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there. We're going to go do some more ceremonial work there, but the energy is off the charts. Like, uh, I'm not that energy sensitive and I felt the energies. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's interesting. It sounds like it's restoring the Tron, the Integra Tron, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, the way I have seen the Trons, um, at least from the deep dive that I did um, with the CERN update that I did was that they were extension um, pieces of the beast machine essentially um or machines that are in the earth that are designed through negative and nefarious agendas and particular race lineage and and lines like you know draco anunnaki lines um kothi and luciferians you know all of these different groups and organizations that have um been building the beast machines really since I think this goes back to the Egyptian Sumerian invasions, um, where I think that these trons and these cerns and these megatrons and these cyclotrons and synchronotrons and, you know, that they've been, you know, this technology is a lot more ancient and older than we actually realize, um, because I think these are tech, these are amnesic technologies, amnesia wiping technologies. So we wonder why we can't remember things. Um, I think they've been degradating and manipulating the biomagnetic field of the earth for quite some time. And I think this has come through the development of those machines um, and really, you know, biohacking the earth's biospiritual architecture and also going deeper into the rod and staff of the earth and getting into pole manipulation, weather manipulation, weather modification, all the things mm -hmm. that, you know, HAARP is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and the CIA and all that stuff, but um, well, is it? Do you think it could be, for example, Van Tassel? He seems to be when he created he his original intention, as he describes it, was this would be a uh, a healing device that people would uh, walk into and spend just a few minutes and do sort of walk around and get get healed. 
and then go out and it would sort of recalibrate. And we were tapping, we were playing some frequencies in there yesterday and trying to tap into some of, of that energy. Mm -hmm. um, however, again, uh, that natural energy of the planet, uh, <clears throat> and, you, and you said it, it's interesting because it did, it did, he did go deep into, there's a, a aquifers, three uh, aquifers that sort of uh, intersect and interject and if you put a compass there it just goes crazy because there's no the the, the energy it's so interesting the psychically as you were saying that i was picking mm -hmm. up on the stone of destiny it has stone something to destiny. do with the stone of destiny something with the moon as well mm -hmm. um because when you said the breath the breastplate i immediately seen that kind of in the hands oh, I, did, I didn't say breastplate Oh, but, you didn't? Okay, yeah. then I must have been seeing it in my head. I must yeah, have been seeing a breastplate. I was seeing like a breastplate that was being given or was being um, in terms of information that it was of some sort of um, activation from the core of creation hmm. um, and carrying the the stone of destiny within that. That's just yeah, kind of, is, that just kind of came destiny? through. Oh, okay, cool. All right, um, more investigations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's really connected to Samaria and Anki and Enlil. And I think it comes down okay. to the Anunnaki bloodlines. Um, and that it was kind of at the core of the warfare of creation, planetary warfare and creation when it came between Tiamat and Maldek or Marduk or the Nibiru systems. Um, There's a, so yeah, many digits there. You're throwing out like, oh, more digits. <laughs> Let's back up though. Um, go back to the Tron. So this, we asked Z this. Uh, she wasn't super familiar with this, but there's, um, and I sort of gave my understanding of the time. But the in your work, and you just said it, both Metatron. There's sort of a, a negative aspect to mm -hmm. these energies, as well as a positive. And I'm wondering if you could sort of define that and explain that how you see those energies. The, particularly Thoth, you know, Hermes, Metatron, we, we these are the sort of the right, same right, Enoch. Right, we right. keep, we know that these energies are overlapping in many ways. Um, but then in your work, and in, in, in also, uh, I forget her name, the lady out of Florida who wrote so many books that are really expensive online right now. Um, Ashana, Ashana Dean. Uh, yeah, Ashana yeah. Dean. She yeah. talks yeah. also about the uh uh sort of the negative metatronic energies could you define that a little bit and go into that yeah definitely um well i'm a huge student of asha and mm -hmm. also lisa renee um and so that's you know kind of at the core of things i definitely like to look into and reference for my own you know personal exploration of these things. Um, mm -hmm. I have sought out a lot of other great minds and great literature and great work. And I've tried to decode these great mysteries of Metatron and Toth mm -hmm. um, because it is um, very polarized um, mm -hmm. in the perception, definitely. Yeah. Um, I do feel that the story with Toth is that he originally um, corrupted the emerald tablets basically um corrupted them. And, i thought he didn't create them um well no he brought them forth basically them forth. and okay. all of the information within it um and that this was somehow um hijacked with energies that basically was a great disillusion or a great deception over humanity and therefore um brought forth the um kabbalistic like jewish mysticism like they've actually like taken it like this was the development of what came from those teachings um and that this brought forth a um capped version of ascension capacities because it's based off of a 12 or a 10 sphere uh universal tree of life which um installed some sort of cap or some sort of limitation in the ascension capacities and also redefined the universal tree of life structure, which is truly like a, a 12 tree, um, Christic, um, organic structure and basically tainted and, and, and redefined that, and then kind of made humanity believe this is what it was. And, and in turn that capped consciousness. Um, so it was mm -hmm. kind of like a great deception. Um, and then from that birthed, you know, archons and, more aspects of the Illuminati or, or whatever that came from that. 
Mm -hmm. um, under all of that um, to basically breed and feed portals into shadow, shadow realms or fallen systems or fallen realms that are, um, uh, what's it called, an entropic system. So they're not um, able to keep expanding. Um, and they're basically all running off of the artificial flower of life system. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> which is where the meta, which where the yeah. metatronic invasion exists so the metatronic okay. parasite is that artificial flower of life which is the entropic flower of life which is inverted um which doesn't allow consciousness to keep spiraling out um and and is this the flower of life with the um uh uh, uh what do you call it the the two rings around it that are keeping it uh enclosed i think you were saying before yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. okay R really when i was looking at it the other day trying to kind of take a step back from these belief systems and just look at the structures themselves right. um it seems that the the old flower of life um do you have i don't know maybe you have a picture of it um or something uh, i can pull something share. up here yeah um i think they just pertain to the third dimensional field that that flower of life any any geometric form is basically going to hold shadow because it is reflecting light um so i think that's what this metatronic perception could ultimately be a, about is that the geometry itself is holding reflections of shadow um therefore opening us up to you know darker systems or wormhole systems or the shadow realms fallen wisa systems um, yeah, so um, this would be more encaps and en entropic in the third dimensional field, holding more uh, inability to expand the true nature of how energy flows within the Earth's body. Right, um, and, that, it, and the, it's traditionally with these two rings, but we there are more. There's other depictions of it that don't have the rings um maybe for example this one and it sort yeah, of goes like in, it goes infinite it's infinite infinity and actually we were playing yesterday with uh different frequencies and uh in cymatic frequencies that uh yeah there's definitely no ring around it so that's that's very interesting that you had sort of mentioned that that ring could be sort of a, a capturing of the uh the energy yeah. I actually um, delved in and kind of channeled the original Tiamat grid structures. Um, I created a diagram for it. It's on my website, indigoangel222.com. Um, yeah, if you want to pull it up. But basically, I kind of was channeling what this core fifth dimensional creation structure. So if you go under my blog work, mm -hmm. and then if you yeah click anywhere. Or okay. yeah, there we go. The this TMI one? grid. Yeah, <clears throat> that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I haven't seen this one yet. This is new. Interesting. Yeah. So you can see the inner core here. Um mm -hmm. the hexagonal shape. Um inside of there would be the halls of Amenti or the Hall of Records. I put the reflection of the entire universe, but it's basically like the super consciousness field of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have that hexagonal structure, which is really definitive of our carbon structures. Um, right. And also hexagonal is just um, very um, defining of life and the flower of life and the fruit of life, the seed of life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very just compatible with expansion. And then, so then we have the emanation of the true universal tree of life. That's an evolving living life field that's um, flowing around the core of that honeycomb matrice, um, which I'm calling that is like the Tiamat's 5d inner body of earth now what i think is happening in the earth right now that this is actually superimposed with that artificial universal tree of life so it, it's this this structure connects into all of the mother arcing systems it connects in all into all of the 13 transharmonic stargate sites on the earth all of the stargate sites on the earth and runs the spiritual basis of our planetary spiritual immune system mm -hmm. i think that metatronic parasitic energy or invasion is um, stuck in those structures and is limiting the flow of the Sophianic 
consciousness here on this earth. And um, that's kind of where I think it's held energetically, according to what I've channeled and seen just doing my uh, grid worker thing where I'm tuning into it. But um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. I, I lost um, our page here. Let me go back to <laughs> um, <laughs> so <clears throat> So Tiamat, can you explain what Tiamat is? Yeah, sure. So this goes back to planetary creation um, and the story of how it goes that we had an original universe. And in that original universe, there was only Tiamat, the sun and Mercury. Um, and this was like the original, the original universe. And then um, we had the Marduk, or you could call it Maldek, or even I think Nibiru. I honestly think they're one and the same. Um, okay. But um, this system came in, um, and it was a it was warfare a system between or the a moons. Planet. It was a planet. <clears throat> yeah, planet. because it, that's the. It said that the uh, uh, um, the asteroid belt was is it, the explosion of of of. Um, Marduk, not Marduk. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe it is the same. TMI. Um, yeah, I think it's. TMI, I think yeah. it's both. I think okay. it's both fragments from both of them. Um, but I believe it was a warfare between the moons. Tiamat had eleven moons. Mm -hmm. um, Marduk or Nibiru had moons as well. So it was the moons that um, imploded into Tiamat's body, um, which mm -hmm. then the remnants from that celestial warfare became the asteroid belt, like you just said, and then what was left to Tiamat actually became the core templating of our earth today. So this would be like the original uh, body of the earth. And this was how our earth was formed. Um, and then the largest moon of Tiamat became our moon. So the moon we have today stores and holds all of this memory to the original creation. And this is why I think honestly, the warfare comes through lunar energies. Um, you'll see that a lot of things are associated to um, when you think about things that have been hijacked or taken over. We talk about the moon chains. We talk about the imposter races, the nefarious races, the invader races, and how they're using the chains of the moon or the entrance points of the moon to come in. All of this, I think, comes from ultimately um, the warfare codes of our how this earth was originally created. Um, and so all of that memory is still stored in the moon. And so it's really clearing our collective uh, core original world wounds um, through the lunar aspects. Well, many people say the moon was brought here in, in as opposed to uh, um, naturally forming. Uh, and then many people say, you know, the moon is artificial. There's a satellite. It's a satellite or... And then there's ideas of um, <clears throat> of uh, uh, some sort of soul capturing device. Oh, my camera went off. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of different theories and ideas around the moon. Uh, yeah. Which one resonates with you the most? Uh, the, no, I definitely, I definitely, I definitely explored them all. The Saturn okay. matrix. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still a great mystery, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, I think that we're, and this comes up so much. This comes up all the time, like people wanting like clarity on this. And right, right. Um, I'm just not sure maybe we're ready for it um, mm -hmm. or there's still karma in the timelines collectively that we're still shedding to further understand more of the moon's participation here. And, um, but um we definitely do know that it plays a huge role in women's reproductive cycles. Yes, and... this is true. <clears throat> yep. Well, yeah. and just, I mean, the influences of it on our earth are just incredible in so many ways, not just mm -hmm. in, with this, all the cycles, like all, any, any yeah. type of cycle. It seems like uh, the moon is involved. Um, going back to the quickly that we, and again, so we're all over the place on this one, but um Going back to the the Metatron, you said portals into the shadow. Could it be just offering a different perspective? Could it be uh, instead of shadow portals into our world, uh, creating light portals for their world? 
I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm open to all potentials. I mean, right, right. Um, I, I've even heard that, you know, the earth is the shadow realm and that the true invaders are the light beings that light invaded earth like earth was a dark matter body right. and that the light that came here was the invading force and so hmm. you know the races that were here living in that shadow like the draco races and mm -hmm. you know the original primordial cedars of the earth were then invaded by the star seeds invaded by right. you know the the people who came from the stars. And so that's why this earth feels so dense to us. And it doesn't actually feel like home is because mm. we're not, this isn't our original home. This isn't our original planet. And right. the races that were here were this more predatorial, aggressive, subterranean culture. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's interesting to, to think about it like that, but then, yeah. Yeah. Well, because I, I think what, what came up when we were talking with Z is that so many people who have tuned into the Metatron energy, uh, including, so it, for me, <clears throat> my for, my sort of first experience into these other realms, I did this uh, thing called a Phoenix bath. Uh, I was very much against any kind of mind altering psych psychedelics, which I'm not now, I'm totally in that camp. But um, at the time, I was like, I, I got to do this as natural as possible, even though it was kind of the same thing. Um, uh, and I, I did this um, <clears throat> uh, hot pepper bath where I uh, it was a is for detoxing and, um, and and cleaning your body. But also it was probably the most excruciating, painful experience I've ever had. Uh, and I've broken bones and done, I do, you know, career stuntman. So that's sort of my um my mo is is dealing with pain and this was excruciating but uh it all it was so excruciating it, it blasted me out of my body and um and i had a dialogue with metatron um and it was sort of like the first type of awareness that i could even have a conversation with Metatron. like i, yeah. I had been meditating and doing uh, martial arts for many years up until that time and uh um uh and i knew that these things existed by reading and 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 talking with other people but i hadn't had my experience until that time so that was but the energy i felt at that time and continue whenever i tap into the metro energy is this very loving expansive um uh, uh you know just uh angelic in many ways so uh, so it, was, it just intrigued me when this this sort of negative Metatron yeah. concept came through. It was like, what? Uh, so that's uh, so I I'm started sort of I don't want to beat a dead horse, but just to go back into that this yeah. conversation. A little bit. Well, I kind of wanted to maybe tell you a little bit some of the research I've done with it. So one thing yeah, I've yeah. come to see is that I feel like it has something to do with the King of Solomon and some some sort of mm. hijacking or superimposition that came in through him and Elisa Crowley and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the greater and the lesser keys of Solomon. Um, one thing I notice is if even if you just try to like research the King of Solomon, you'll get a lot of pictures that will come up online that will actually be Metatron's face superimposed over King of Solomon. Oh, so wow. um, it's just, there's something hijacked that came in through right. that. I don't know where or exactly how in history, the, the, the pinpoint fabric point, but I know it's connected to that. And I right. think also to the whereabouts of the Ark of the Covenant and what they're doing with that. Um, where do you think it is? Jerusalem? Well, um, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Oh, oh, Ethiopia. yes, yes, yes. Okay, I know that thread. All right, I know what you're talking about. If I follow that thread a little bit. The, one of yeah. the uh uh one of the like an ethiopian king or queen queen was it queen of that? sheba okay yeah, yeah yeah okay queen of sheba had a child with king of solomon oh. and his son was supposed to have been the one that held it um in secrecy in ethiopia and um, I think there's actually a new eighth wonder of the world. There's actually like this underground temple. I think it's going to be a new man-made Stargate, honestly, because that's what I'm picking up on it energetically. But there's a new like underground temple in Ethiopia that's just being excavated right now. That's oh. kind of a big deal, but might be connected to the Ark of the Covenant. What I've actually kind of seen okay. with the Ark of the Covenant is that it's transcended 
into a portal passageway into the Andromedan system. So um, I think mm. all of the areas that it once which existed because it was so powerful that it created activation zones in those locations and areas and created and filamented into streams of celestial and cosmic passageways that um, is where honestly the energy may have been coming from all along or energy was being released too, but it I think was opening up to greater um, streams of cosmic in intelligence fields, definitely. It was kind of a, a portable portal, right? The Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah and, and, and and with that, on that stream, uh, let's go into the skulls because uh, you've mentioned them in some of your talks, but we've never had the conversation and that's sort of my work right now. What's your take on the uh, the crystal skull phenomenon and, and uh, the 13, the legend of the 13 skulls? Yes. Well, that's such an exciting thing. Um, I, what I've, what I've gathered is that they were um, potentially all together at one point in temples down in the Bermuda Triangle um, in the time of Atlantis. And during the time that Atlantis and Lemuria, you know, separated and the grid fabrics kind of uh, went on their way and, and um, things were, um, imploded and dissolved into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, essentially, Mer Priest took those to the women of Isla Mujeres, um, the Isle of Women, and gave them to the Mayan grandmothers to keep them in safety and in secrecy. Um, and that they are an actual spiritual living library of information from the Atlantean time that was encoded. Um, with mm -hmm. all of the spiritual knowledge and records of that time. And that um, I think what I've heard is that the, it takes like a, a particular priestess that was a descendant of those bloodlines that has the activation codes and the actual knowledge in song um, to go through to like him of certain rhythm that can actually open the skulls up. Um, yep. That I've resonates heard that with parts what we've been doing. <clears throat> okay, is it? Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have heard that they might actually be being held in Machu Picchu, or one or two of them might be in Machu Picchu, that now they're kind of unknown in, in multiple disclosed locations. Um, that's about as far, that's about as much as I know about the 13 crystal skulls. <laughs> All right, well, that's that's a good, yeah. uh, some good cross-reference of some of the data sets that I've been playing with on on my journey with this uh with this film project so and it's uh, you know like the moon it's a great mystery that we're still uncovering so that's uh we can't have all of our presence up front otherwise what would we do we just sit around and I don't know uh but this is this we'd have great we would not be having these great conversations about you know the mysteries of the universe um if we already knew them all so this is part of the fun I'm gonna Go ahead and, uh, you know, I, I know we covered a ton of stuff. And uh, so anybody who wants to dive in and start asking some questions, I'm going to keep the conversation going, but uh, raise your hand. and.